Thanks for subscribing and listening to the Clive Barker Podcast, the only podcast dedicated to the imagination of Clive Barker. In this episode 206, we discuss the demon of the Ninth Circle, Mr. Begone. We had a lot of great discussion about this short novel by Clive Barker, as well as listener feedback. All right, well, welcome. This is episode 206 of the Clive Barker podcast. This is, uh, we're talking about Mr. B Gone. Yay! Uh, <laughs> came out in in October, uh, October 30th, right? 2007? Right. So I think that's when the hardcover came out. And uh, yeah, it was a Halloween release. That was yeah. exciting. I, I remember when it came out and I think our friend Maureen went to one of those uh, pre-release signing parties and uh, she got me a copy of the book uh, signed by Clive and I got it in Portugal and I read it before the actual release date. So that was fun. Wow. I, I, I flew down to Seattle and I went to two different book signings, one in Seattle and one in Woodinville, Washington the next day. You know, yeah, I was looking at the Revelations website and uh, sometimes they include uh, sketches that Clive did in mm -hmm. book signings. And I saw for the Mr. Be Gone one, there was one saying to Ryan, best wishes, Clive Barker. Is that a photo of your book? Yeah, it is. Oh, that's so cool. <clears throat> the, he had an assistant at the time that was taking pictures of all the sketches that he liked where he would do one and go, oh, wait, that's a good one. Save that. And then his assistant would take a picture of it. Oh, that's great. Yeah, it's it's a cool uh, sketch that you that you got on your volume. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy with it. It's it's uh, it looks like it it's a demon, I guess. It's Mr. Be Gone. Uh, could be. Yeah, yeah, he he never he said in an interview that he never wanted to uh, sketch any of those characters in the book. But then I believe that at one of those uh, galleries slash bookstores, I remember him doing something like a cartoon painting. Oh wow! You remember that? No, yeah, he did something. Cool. He did like a demon that was like black and white with spiral designs on his skin. And you can see that on the Revelations website as well. So oh, that's I'll cool. put a link to that at the show notes. Yeah, yeah I'm not I'm sure curious. if that was Katoon because Katoon is supposed to be uh, purple and blue and stuff like that, right? I can't remember what he was. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 when I imagine him, I still I always imagine him in this big suit of armor with his face covered up. And... <laughs> yeah. 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 So it was an interesting book. He um, it took five months to write, apparently, including different drafts. Um, Clive okay. said in an interview um, to uh, Paul Kane, I believe it said include it took five months, including different drafts. I wrote it in a sort of madness. Once I started, I couldn't stop. It was strange. It was very strange. I even suspended painting for a while, which I haven't done for a long time and was not good for me physically. I actually keep fit by painting four hours a day. <laughs> so um, he had finished the penultimate draft of the Scarlet Gospels. And uh, I think he was feeling like uh, a little burned out by the Scarlet Gospels. And um, before he wrote the final 4,000 pages of it, he... Uh, told his editors that he was writing a novella called Mr. Be Gone. And, uh, yeah, he was, um, he, he kind of gave a voice to that little nagging voice in his head, uh, of Jacobach Botch, the protagonist of this book. Right. And, and I think it also didn't, didn't it come out in between, um, Aberat two and Aberat three. And I, re I remember it being a surprise. Like I, I, I mean, I guess it looks like you found some, um, pre interviews about it but at the time i was I, it just kind of came out of nowhere to me i didn't i i didn't remember reading anything about this before it came out yeah it totally did um it, it kind of blindsided everybody i think we were like hey when's the new clive barker book coming when's the next a next aberrant book mm -hmm. coming and all of a sudden it's like hey here's one mr be gone so yeah. i'm not sure where this came from but like he said in an interview uh, he keeps a journal of ideas, okay, that come along. So he went through that, and he, he found the word Jacobock, which he kind of liked. And uh, so it was. he had a period where he said he was inventing names, and uh, he has nights where he just decides to fill up uh, pages with invented names. Uh, he says, most of which will be shit, but every 25th one will be worth something. <laughs> That's cool. And Jacobock had a nice rhythm to it. Then I'd written, not book. And then the phrase, burn this book, and it sort of went from there. <laughs> wow. 
Yeah. Yeah, and he had described it later in interviews that uh, it was like this nagging voice that was uh, constantly bugging him. And so yeah, yeah. I, I lo- what I love is, uh, I love the meta story of this, right? Did you just imagine this character that's in his head and keeping him from getting his Aberat done or his Scarlet Gospels done and uh, this 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 nagging head nagging character that's like a that's a demon, right? So he exercises his demon by putting it into a book, which is the plot of the book. It, to me that's just amazing, you know, that um I, I and that we will get into other people's comments. A lot of people sort of treat this like a. I had somebody called it a throwaway book, and so, you know people think it's oh well, you know treat it like it's it's just kind of pulpy, but to me uh-huh. I think it's really cool. I and I think it's really clever the way you know the way he's he's exercising a demon by writing a book, and the plot of the book is that a demon gets exercised into a book. Right. Uh, I think Clive wrote about this character that he uh, referred to Jacobock Botch or Mr. Begon as the dark half of me. That's why there's a B in his name. So yeah. it's like uh, the B is for Barker, not Botch. Yeah, but, right. uh, yeah and he said uh, that Jacobock, Jacobock kept, uh, kept calling him back to the page. Um, even when he was weary, uh, he says, I couldn't shut him up. He was there in my head. I knew what the next sentence was always, always. And um, but it's strange because this uh, this demon, uh, he's not he's not the main villain. He's not an, an, an evil. Well, I shouldn't say he's not an evil villain because he, he bathes in children's blood. But yeah. despite being a demon, he is also a witness of human evil for the most part. Um, it it kind of subverts our expectations in the sense that uh, the, the this demon ends up suffering more at the hands of humans than than they do at his hands, it seems. Um, at, at least until he meets his other demonic companion, Katoon, right? Yeah, yeah. This, um, <clears throat> the, it's really interesting because it's you, 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 you kind of go back and forth. You, you know, it's like he's he starts out innocent and he becomes more and more evil from his exposure to the world, and and not right. so. And he's so he's innocent when he's in hell. Uh, but he become, I mean, relatively, I guess, innocent. In <laughs> relatively. Yeah. Yeah. But, but when he's in the human world, uh, he sort of evolves to become more evil and, and, uh, the more he's disappointed with the world and, and, uh, and love. Yeah. Yeah. As a, as a demon of the ninth circle, um, I thought at first the demons having mothers and fathers and, and, and kind of uselessly craving attention from either it seemed like an odd choice, but um, but then I realized that the, the the dysfunctional nature and the the context of his family in hell. So they're basically they live on the ninth circle of hell, and they live surrounded by mountains of trash that I think come from their household. Yeah, so of that's garbage. the whole point. Yeah, they live in this house in the ninth circle of hell, and Jacobock's dad, uh, Papa Gatmus, yeah. I think. Mm-hmm. He's he's the guy who goes out and he uh, some of the lost souls that are wandering the garbage looking for something, you know, useful. He has like a gun and a machete, right? Yeah, which is um, which makes kind of makes hell a sort of a, an anachronism because when they're hauled out, it's like what is it like sixteen hundreds or something? Because it's it's, it's at like least the third. It's, it's at least a hundred years before the invention of the printing press, because it takes them over a hundred right. years to, to get to Mainz. Yeah. 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 So, uh, it's about the 1300s when he gets fished out of hell. Yeah. But if so I could just go back to, so to Jack sh- childhood. So yeah. he shouldn't have a, a handgun, right? Well, I feel <clears throat> like in this sense, um, there's some stuff at the end that happens that tells me that it's like the demons and angels can see through the entire timeline of, of time. And so it seems like they can yeah. just there's stuff that they can just tap into even from the future or the past or whatever they can just bring that uh, with them in the, into the uh, the gulf so to speak. Yeah. Um, but what I wanted to say about Box childhood is that I was talking about the dysfunctional nature of his family. They're demons, right? I mean, yeah. I realize that. I mean, monsters aren't necessarily just born monsters, right? In hell, they're kind of made bit by bit, you know, constructed out of anger, hate, despair, and resentment. 
and that makes them more powerful as they grow, right? So they they may have, you know, like Katoon, you know, his kind of like royalties. They descend back to the first fallen or whatever. So they may have pedigree within demons uh, and some innate skills like making fire and stuff. Yeah. Um, uh, Jack of Box mother, for example, she can set fire to something just by spitting on it, right? Yeah. Um, but uh, they're also educated. They learn stuff in hell. They become spiteful with that evil that comes from within, from their horrible lives that they lead in hell. So when Jacobok loses that connection, you know, he, his mother hates him. His father tries to kill him. He gets fished out of hell at the beginning of the book. Yeah. Like, he's lost because he's cut off from his nature as a demon. Um, so he's not just cut off from his nature as a demon. He's actually like, he, he gets burned, right? Mm -hmm. He's not even in hell anymore. And, and, and look at what we're saying. It's like, Oh, a demon got burned. It's like saying a fish drowned. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, so, if, yeah. If you have that conception of hell of just being, is just being fire, you know, never ending fire and that the demons all just live in it, which is not, you know, that's not the hell that he's showing us. Right, right. So I, I recall reading the Paradise Lost uh, poem by John Milton mm -hmm. when I was younger, and I was reading about that, and, uh, you know, all the demons wake up, and they're, like, in hell, and there's, like, black fire and black flames, and it's like... And then when they were writing Hellraiser, and Peter Atkins was talking about a Hellbound script, and he was telling the producers, you know, well, that Leviathan's going to have black light coming out of it, and they were like, what is black light? You can't make black light. <laughs> yeah. And then they ended up making that weird negative light that comes out of Leviathan. Right. Yeah. So, um, and it, it, came, it, it came out great. I'm glad that he, I'm glad that he pushed on that and made it happen. Yeah. But in here, this hell is, uh, it's made out of circles. It's kind of like this, uh, mm -hmm. Dante's Inferno kind of thing, which yeah. I'm not sure connects really to the Scarlet Gospels vision of hell. Yeah. I don't I remember. I wanted to talk about that because it, it, yeah, how different is this from from the Scarlet Gospels hell and from the gulfs? Right. Um, yeah, that's an interesting thing because it seems like this is more self-contained in mm -hmm. that regard. Um, although Clive in interviews talks about Pinhead being a more elegant demon than Jacobock and how he wanted the language that comes from Jacobock to be more coarse, more simple, yeah. smaller words, uh, smaller sentences because... He's not a, a, a learned demon, even though he can write, right? That's what he's, gets him into trouble. He's still in the way first smarter place. than his than his father. Right. Yes. Papa Gatmus. Yeah. Um, so what happens that sets all this in motion is that he is a small runt of a demon in the ninth circle of hell. And he writes. He uh, he's an he's an author of sorts, but what he writes is just horrible um revenge fantasies and yeah. horrible things that he wants to do to everybody in hell that has, you know, that uh, caused him pain or anger or anything. And of course, the the brunt of that it, that he writes about is about his dad yeah. uh, because he hates his father and his father hates him. And uh, one day he just keeps putting all this written stuff in like a hole. And one day he comes home and his mother discovered all his cache of uh, of writings and uh, and he's pretty impressed by the size of it. He's like, wow, that's the first time I ever saw all the papers that I had written in my life. And uh, it was a lot. And Because um, his mother had hauled them all out of the hole in the floor. Right. And his mom is really angry at him. And again, they're demons. So this doesn't really make a lot of sense why she would be angry that he was writing these horrible things. I think she, was, he she was angry because she was afraid of when his father saw them. Right. She yeah. wanted to burn them before uh, before he got a chance to, to see them. And it makes you feel like there should be um, like his mother expected him to be a little more sophisticated mm -hmm. and less of a, a, an angry little petty demon. Yeah. Um, and his father maybe. doesn't want him to to uh, to be smart or to, you know, to uh, look down on him. And yeah. And and uh, so. His mother tells him, well, you know what? Um, I wish I, I had never I had never had you. And um, and he decides to play his cards and say that, well, I want to be a big demon. And uh, I'm just writing that stuff uh, to learn about the horrible things that we can do. And I want to create a machine and I want to make a disemboweling machine that will uh, torture all these lost souls or wandering around. 
And her, his mother is like, hmm, go on. <laughs> yeah. She's kind of interested and impressed that uh, he's supposed to be kind of a smallish demon. And she's mm -hmm. like, oh, she's impressed at the long words like disembowelment yeah. that come out of his mouth. And she's like, huh, maybe my little runt of a demon child is not that stupid. Yeah. Uh, but she still says, whatever, you still got to drag all this stuff down there and burn it. Because if your dad sees this, he's going to he's going to kill you. Yeah. And uh, did, did you notice yeah. I, I kind of was as I was reading this, I kept thinking back on, you know, that interview that Clive did for the Candyman uh, Arrow Blu-ray mm -hmm. where he was talking about his father and how his his uh, father was always saying, you know, that he that he he got the wrong son or he wished he hadn't been born. Right, and, uh, that feeling of being an outsider, even to your own family, I guess. Yeah, yeah, and so here we've got Jacobock, you know, writing and and being sort of despised by his father for, you know, for not being sort of a more blue collar. Um, yeah, you know, and working and, demon. Yeah, so it, I I kept thinking, man, is you know, is Pappy Gatmus, you know, like a, a, a an exaggerated version of Clive's father. I mean, there there seems to be a twinge of autobiography in this because, mm -hmm. um, you know, he Jacobock writes stuff and, um, you know, he falls in love with another male demon and uh, they do have this this uh, falling out. And I believe that Clive and David Armstrong did have a falling out around 2008, 2009, I think. I think David ended up moving out of the house in Beverly Hills around yeah. April of 2009. Um, so at this time, I think that Clive was getting a little, um, the relationship between Jacobock and Katoon seems to be, he, he keeps mentioning that love is a lie and is very disappointed about it. And, uh, and it seems like there's no, there's a lack of communication between them, um, that ultimately causes a gigantic spat and, uh, it, it breaks them up. Yeah. Um, they so, seem to care about each other, but. Quatoon is kind of enigmatic. He's hard to he's hard to figure out, right? Because he's um, right. He 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 says that he re, that he that he cares about Jacobock, but at the same time, he's pretty cruel to him, and and uh, and he and he kind of laughs at him and looks down on him, and and is indifferent, you know, at times. Yeah, and and at the end when they break up, um, Jacobock simply wants to walk the other way and move away from him, but he says, "Oh no, uh, don't do it, botch." Uh, what are you going to do? You're going to die. And they yeah. says, no, I'm not. I was alive before you and I'll be alive after. And he's I've like, done, no, I've, I've been you through with will you. die. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then he's like, starts throwing uh, fireballs at uh, Botch. Yeah. But, you know, we're kind of jumping a little bit ahead. But, uh, yeah, so I thought it was interesting that Jacobock is a witness to the events in this book as much as um, Edmund Maddox uh, mm -hmm. in Galilee is a witness to his f own family history. Yeah. Or Harry the Moor is a witness to the events in hell and the hell priest's plans. And um, I think here Jacobock is another character that seems to be caught in some something larger than he is. And he's not entirely sure why he is a part of the story, yeah. but he's there and he witnesses it. So um, that's also, an interesting. Uh, mm. There's also something kind of creepy about the way that the book is talking directly to you. And um in, in this sort of superstitious way that that also that would make you not want to say Candyman in the mirror five times, you're also kind of in the back of your mind thinking, you know, when he's saying like every t time you turn a page, I'm taking one step closer to you with my knife, and it's yeah. it's a little creepy, even though you know, well, I'm just reading a book that Clive Barker wrote, you know, but it's still a little creepy, and somewhere in your mind, you th you know, you get this little sort of nagging feeling, like what if this was true. Yes. Yeah. Um, so throughout the entire book, that's something that some people liked and other people didn't like it so much. <clears throat> it, it it does surface every other every other page or so. I wouldn't say every other page, but um, but it does surface a, a good number of times throughout the book that he's constantly pleading yeah. with the with the reader of the book that, you know, burn this book, get rid of it, destroy yeah. it now, don't read another word. And then at the same time, he entices you with a story. And he, yeah. if he didn't want you to read, he shouldn't have started the story, right? And yeah, then yeah. He, even he's, at points, he's, he's torn between like wanting to tell his story and just wanting to die because he's he hates being trapped in this prison of a book. You know, I could see it that way, but I could also see it a different way. He knows exactly what he's doing. He starts telling us the story so we can read the whole book to the end. And yeah. uh, and I think that when he says burn this book, 
it, it's not because he wants to be done in a way and turn into ash. It's because he will be released from the book if you burn it. Uh, that's the only way to release him from the spell mm. that he was uh, was cast upon him. Uh, so that's that's the that's what I took out of it um, is that he constantly tells you the story to keep you interested. And he uses reverse psychology to try to get <laughs> you to burn the book. Hmm. and and release him so that's 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 basically it uh to well, me that, that he, i mean you, you could make a pretty good case for that because throughout the book he he's um since he's not a powerful demon he mostly uses his words he's clever so he uses his words to get out of tight situations and and so you know i could see that yeah yeah so this came out in halloween right so i remember reading um you know, stuff saying that uh, this is going to be published on Halloween and uh, it the book that you got and the graphic design of the book was also very appealing to me. Um, I love old books, right? I mean, I love to go into like an old bookseller store in Portugal and just, you know, buildings that were there, you know, when America was, you know, <laughs> from the 1800s. Yeah. Um and you see within the stucco walls and the old shelves that are creaky and the dusty volumes that you take out, you would pull a book out and it's like, oh, 1838. And you're like, oh, how much for this book? Oh, five euros. And you're like, oh, wow. Yeah, I'll buy it. Shucks. Wow. And um, so I've always been interested in old books and stuff. So the graphic design of Mr. Be Gone and especially the, the hardcover, which is the one I own, I think the paperback, they also did that. But – the pages were deliberately printed to look yellow, right? They yeah. had these like they, they acid also marks. Had, and, yeah, little spots on them too. Yeah, like little acid marks and stuff. And it's like, wow, they did this to look like an old book. Yeah. And it's uh, it's really, really cool. I thought that was uh, very appealing to me uh, design-wise. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I was really happy with that when it came out. And I, I've never... I don't think I've ever taken any time to look at the paperback. I don't own it or anything. I just, you know, I, I, I ended up buying uh, four copies of the hardcover when it came out because of dragging people to the book site. Right. Yeah. Uh, so this is, it looks that way because it's supposed to be a one of a kind book, right? It's supposed to be this demonic memoir that was written in the year 1438. And it's just one copy that's been buried by an assistant who worked for Johannes Gutenberg of, the, of who created the printing press. So, and that's supposed to be the book that you're getting in your hands right now is the one that holds the demon. And um, so it yeah, was like thirteen something when he was fished out of hell. Yeah, it was thirteen something, and then he gets to uh, travel with Katoon for like a hundred years before they actually make it to mines. Mm -hmm. um, and and so. In broad strokes, I think the story can be told this way. It's a demon gets fished out of hell in medieval times, and then he discovers another demon who saves him from being killed by an angry mob. And then he, uh, you know, they live together. They do all sorts of adventures, which just the things that they mention, like briefly, that could be a whole entire book, right? Yeah. Yeah, um, right. And they, they talk about it like, oh, yeah, here's some stuff that happened, you know, during the time that I was traveling with Katoon. And it's like, Oh, I kind of would have liked to, you know, I guess we don't have a hundred years to read this book. So, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I would, you know, some of the highlights I would have liked to have, you know, had them happen firsthand in the, in the book instead of as you know, just recalling. Right. I mean, there's, um, and, and for people who know old books and old stuff and, uh, you know, prints and stuff like that from, from the 1400s, 1500s, um, there's one called, you know, they mentioned the Hamburg Dance of Death at one point when yeah. uh, Jacobock tells uh, an archbishop that, um, yeah, me and Katoon once went into a, a cemetery and we brought back to life all the corpses and, and we told them the end of the world was coming and that they had to dig their way out of the graves and dance. And so <laughs> yeah. the archbishop is kind of impressed. He's like, the Hamburg Dance of Death was your doing? And you can actually see that uh, it's the work of Hans Holbein, and it was called Totentanz, which means the dance of death in German. And uh, it's it's a great little uh, poetry book with uh, these woodcuts. Um, oh. Basic, yeah, it's basically death, just, um, you know, death and dead people. Um, it's like a, it's, it's a bunch of little analogies and stuff like that and little fables about death, talking to someone or seeing a merchant or talking to a beautiful lady and stuff like that. 
and um, you get like skeletons beating on drums and people dancing and stuff like that. So uh, if you can find the Dance of Death by Hans Holbein, I recommend looking at those wood prints uh, uh, etchings because they're really, really cool. Uh, if I find a link for that, I'll put on the show notes. Yeah, yeah, that would be cool. When I, when I, um, what was I thinking of? Oh, when I, when I first read this book, something kind of stuck out to me. I'm like, wait a minute. This is like a book that I read a lot when I was a kid. It was my favorite book. Uh, the monster at the end of this book. Right. What, with Grover. With, yeah. With Grover. And, and have you read that book? Uh, no, I just okay. saw, I just saw it briefly on the internet and, um, I thought it was, it was pretty funny. That's why I used it to promote this episode. Yeah. I was like, hey, you know, it's the monster at the end of the book. Uh, yeah. We're going to just, yeah. Grover is telling you throughout the book, don't turn the page. Don't turn the page. There's a monster at the end of the book and I'm scared. <laughs> and then you turn the page yeah. and he's like, I told you not to turn the page. And then there's another one where he's like building a brick wall in front of the page and you turn the brick page and it destroys the brick wall. And yeah. So it's, it's got some, I mean, I, you know, I didn't, I wouldn't, wasn't seriously thinking that Clive copied that book, but, uh, when this came out, I mailed it to him. Uh, <laughs> you did? Yeah. That's great. He went, cause he had asked me to send him copies of that Imagica card game poster because right, he, he right. had never seen it before. So I also threw mm -hmm. that, I also bought a copy of that book for him and sent that and. He did. He 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 sent an email thanking me for the posters, but he didn't say anything about the, about the monster <laughs> at the end of this book. I don't know if he yeah. saw that, thought that was funny, or if he got the joke. But yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the reason why I brought it up yesterday uh, on Facebook was because I was reading in reviews for the book on Amazon, and one of the reviewers actually said, "Hey, this reminds me of the monster at the end of the book with mm -hmm. you know our lovable blue monster Grover from oh, Sesame yeah. Street." So. That's why I was like, oh, wow, look at that. And then I looked it up and I, I figured out what it was about. So, um, yeah, but so, so Jacobock, um, he, he, um, seems like a, an innocent monster when he comes out of hell, right? Like you mentioned, uh, he's still a, a, a demon child, I guess. And so when I mentioned that he seemed to be, uh, suffer more at the hands of, of mankind than he, than the, than what he does to mankind. Um, he's yeah. basically a victim when they fish him out of hell. And even though he kills a few people, um, he's still on his way out, uh, about to be killed when he meets Katoon. And, uh, you mentioned Katoon being in armor and that's because he was, um, he was pretending to be a knight, right? Yeah. Yeah. Pretending to be a, one of the guards for the, for the archbishop, I think. Yeah, and I think he was there just to, so he could see the old archbishop is about to get burned at the stake for um, for having sodomitic animals, apparently. He had some farm animals that uh, were caught fornicating two males, and then I guess they were going to burn the animals and the archbishop yeah. for some reason. And, um, and the we another, th another thing that kind of caught me as funny, or kind of sad, but they said, they said Several months earlier, they had burned the previous archbishop. <laughs> it's like, geez, who would want to take that job? People who like to burn other people, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the mob finds him and they, they see that he's demonic and he has tails and he has these scale uh, feet with three toes. And so even though he's burned and he's passable as a human, you know, he can pass as a human if he dresses up in a few rags and he hides his tails. He can. Um, he doesn't have the scales because they were burned um, when he fell on. Uh, oh yeah, we never mentioned how he got burned. So his mother, when she tells him to burn his writings, she she coughs up a wad of phlegm, and she uh, sets fire to the big mountain of writings that Jacobock had in hell. Yeah. And um, he gets so affected by destroying his own work <clears throat> that he just stands there in front of the fire, a little too close to the fire. And um, he can feel like the tears in his eyes evaporate before they even run down his face. And at some point, the heat gets to him in such a way that he falls forward and he falls right on top of the hell flames that are consuming the writings. And um, and that's that's how he becomes uh, scarred and burned. And his, and his dad doesn't really care, right? His father was so, so busy beating his mother that he didn't bother to pull Jacobock out of the fire. 
until a few minutes had passed and he yeah. was like being consumed yeah. and uh yeah and and then um he well demons don't die easily right so even if you stab them like he says in the book if you stab them you cut them they'll suffer they'll bleed but they'll heal um but um he he wakes up from the fire discovers that he's completely burned uh from head to to groin and he runs up to his house and his dad actually fishes a few pages out of the fire and discovers that he was writing stuff about his dad, telling all sorts of insults. And he's like, oh, I'm going to kill that kid. Yeah. And so there's a chase scene with in the mountains of, of, of trash where Papa Gatmas is chasing a still smoking Jacobock. And, yeah. uh, and they get to the top of this hill and they find uh, a couple of steaks and a couple of cans of beer, <laughs> yeah. which... Yeah, which again was... seems anachronistic, but yes. you know, uh, yeah, because this is the 1300s um, up mm-hmm. above. So there's a few medieval demon hunters, and they like to catch demons mm-hmm. and skin them. Yeah, and, where, where and, did and... those 1300s, you know, demon hunter guys get cans of beer? Uh, yeah, maybe maybe they were like those metal tins for keeping milk. I don't know. I mean, yeah. I if he had said two steins of beer, that would have made more sense, right? Yeah. That's true. Yeah. yeah. Well, but that's and, how they got fished out of hell. I thought that the I, this idea of of hell being like a hole in the ground, you know, like a literal hole in the ground that people could fish them up out of, was so so sort of medieval and primitive compared right, to right. the gulfs and what the way Clive talks about hell in in other you know in the books of blood and and in the in in the Scarlet Gospels and stuff. Right. I mean, there's plenty of places around the world which in medieval times were considered to be entrances to the uh, underworld. There's these caves, you know, and uh, even in Portugal, there used to be a place called Hell's Mouth where Aleister Crowley faked his own death once. um, And uh, he went there and it's just this big hole in a cliff where the sea kind of dug a big cave into. And there's all these jagged spikes around it. But they used to call it the Hell's Mouth and they still do. Um, because there's a whirlpool and there's all sorts of like things that happen over there with that cave and the sea and the rocks that if you go swimming there, you're probably going to die. <laughs> mm. And yeah. And so, uh, as, as so many people died there, they ended up calling it hell's mouth. And there used to be places that, that were told to be, um, caves that would lead down into hell. I mean, if you're into the whole creepy pasta kind of thing, there's like, there's this video about the, these miners in Moscow dug too deep and then they found this hole and they put a microphone down the hole and you could hear this weird noise that sounds like thousands of people screaming. And you wow. can find that on YouTube. I was always fascinated by that stuff. My great grandfather used to have books. Um, a couple of those were about demonology and, you know, the history of the devil and stuff like that. And so I would read those books and uh, read about how the witches would like rub this ointment and they would hallucinate that they were going to the Sabbath and all that stuff. And they would fly on their broom. Um, so that was fun uh, learning about that stuff at an early age. I guess it kind of gave me an education and a fascination for like the hierarchies of hell. Um, but the idea that hell is a hole in the ground, like you said, is very medieval. Um, I'm just – there's parts here when they're being fished out through the circles that it seems though that they're just crossing into different planes as they go into different circles because it's not just a big hole. It's like they're being pulled through the circles. And at one point it says that, you know, there's nothing below them, but all of a sudden they get wet because they get pulled through this swampland of another circle. And so it's like there's this portal between circles that they just get sucked into. Right. Yeah, and and it, the the part that kind of fascinates me is that these these demon hunter people are not don't seem like smart people at all. They you know maybe Crawley is the smartest one out of all of them because he, he's the boss, but yeah, they Crawley. they don't they don't seem like that they don't seem like wizards or you know high priests that are super knowledgeable in the occult that they would be able to to pull something like this off. It's just. And I don't think that it's bad. I just think it's really strange, kind of a an interesting, uh, interesting choice in in uh, in the way these characters are sort of portrayed. It does make me wonder how how they manage to do what they do because you're fishing a demon out of hell, and then um, when Jacobock escapes their um, 
they're trying to they're trying to um, trap him with this kind of a hood. They call it a hood, but it's really made out of iron and it's really heavy and stuff. They want to put that on his face and lock it. And it kind of reminded me of the mask that Nyx has in uh, yeah. the Lord of Illusions film, right? Yeah. Um, but how do they manage to subdue demons from hell? And uh, because it, he he runs into their camp and there's like there's skin demons being chopped up and there's uh, demon skins hung to dry and there's uh, demon tails being uh, having the meat boiled out of their bones and just uh, mounted on to be mm -hmm. sold. And I'm like, but you know. What if Papa Gatmus had made it all the way up, <laughs> right? right? How would they have subdued Papa Gatmus? Right, um, or, or it, Quitoon, right? I mean, Quitoon must have been fished out of hell, too, and he escaped, but he didn't kill all those guys. I don't, yeah. I, or, or he came up out of hell, I'm not sure, because you do see that demons and angels do walk the earth um, yeah. at but, the end of the book. So. But I thought he had, when Jacobock first met him, I thought he had asked him, did you get fish, did, did the fishermen get you too, or something like oh, that. Oh, okay. But I don't right. remember, I don't remember specifically the, the response to it, but. Or he knows of them. I mean, he was living in that village pretending to be a guard, so yeah. maybe he was aware that there were demon hunters there. Yeah, yeah, that's probably what it is. But yeah, once they get him out of the ground, their plan to catch him seems really incompetent, doesn't it? Yeah, it sure does. <laughs> yeah. uh, they do have a dog, but it's not like the dog does much to uh, to help uh, subdue the demon, right? Yeah. Um, it's funny because back then, people were really gullible. And I've been to exhibits about uh, things that people believed uh, were real, like um, mermaids. Um, yeah. And then you go see them and it's just the torso of a monkey uh, <laughs> and someone someone cut them in half. And then they they modeled with clay like this, this mermaid tail. And then they kind of mummify the whole thing and painted it to look like a, a, a mermaid mummy. And uh, you see that and it says, well, this used to be what people believed to be like a, a cryptid. Uh, it's a mixture between a, a monkey, a monkey corpse and uh a mermaid tail that was modeled out of clay, but people would believe that that was real, and they would go see that in carnivals and 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 believe wow. that that was real. Like in House uh, of a Thousand Corpses, where they would catch people and and right. kill them and and uh, cut them up and put and and put a fish tail on on a real dead human being and say no, this was a mermaid or whatever. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I remember seeing in one of those exhibitions one of these medieval creatures that were believed to be. Um, stealing maiden's virg uh, virginity and one of them is actually i kid you not it's um i forgot the name that they called it but i have to look that up but it was this creature that was basically just a a, a dick with wings and feet <laughs> and it was su it's supposed to come out of hell and if a lady was resting under a tree or reading or something they would show up and they would take her virginity of course, now we know that this was just an excuse for ladies who would go with their boyfriends to do a picnic and they would end up having sex. And then they would just tell their parents, no, no, a, a, a demon, yeah. <laughs> one of those things came over and attacked me and, oh, it took my virginity. Oh, no. So <laughs> there was a lot of stuff in the medieval <laughs> yeah. times that people believed or just yeah. made up. And uh, it yeah. was total nonsense. Um well, and and with this book, uh, it's got a little bit of a a little bit of a fantasy feel to it in in the way that this this uh, it plays a little bit fast and loose with with history and and uh, demons and angels are just kind of walk the world and are a little bit commonplace, like especially demons. Uh, people yeah. are oh yeah, we saw another demon yesterday, kind of a thing. Right, and uh, so. Jacobock and Katoon end up spending almost 100 years together, and Katoon keeps holding this secret that's going to happen, and he wants to be there when it does, and it seems like he has this sort of prescience of what's to come. Yeah. And even though it takes 100 years, um, so ultimately Katoon tells him that there's this machine that's being built in mines, and he wants to be there when that happens because it's going to change the world. Yeah. And uh, mines was the birthplace of... Johannes Gutenberg, the man who created the printing press, and this is basically what this is about. And um, so I, I thought that it, Jacobock, um, you know, he's a demon who starts his life by writing. He's defined by his writing mm -hmm. and, and the episode where his mother forces him to burn his writings. 
And in a way, he becomes words at the end of the book. He becomes the book, right? So there's this theme in regards to Jacobock Botch that seems to incarnate this secret of writing as a sort of um, catharsis, um, uh, the power of words to change one's life one way or the other. And I think one of the things that the printing press changed the world was that it made mankind more educated. It helped us yeah. move forward. Because at that time, the only way that you could get a book was if it was a handwritten book that someone had copied from another place, and then you would be able to get a copy, you know, if someone wrote it down for you, and you would get that manuscript, and that's, or you had it by oral tradition, right? Someone would tell you a story, and you'd buy them a flagon of wine or whatever. Yeah. So but this, when books this was came a big along, deal because yeah. then then books could go all over the world, and and, uh, and to anyone anyone who could read could get a copy right. of them. Right. And that kind of pushed people a little more into being able to learn how to read because with books, you also got school books. And, uh, and so that really, really did change the world. Um, so it, it, it seems to, um, like Jacobox seems to have a role to play in this story. At the same time, he's just a witness. Um, at one point when, after Katoon and Jacobox break up, uh, because Jacobock wasn't that interested in uh, in finding out what the printing press was, and he didn't realize the scope of what was about to happen. So he didn't understand why Katoon was so obsessed with it, right? Well, and Katoon and, wouldn't even tell him what the invention was either. Right, right. So after they break up, um, I think he still feels drawn to see Katoon again and just figure out what was the whole deal about that invention. So he follows him to mines. And when they get to mines, there's this seems to be a city that's under siege by powers of heaven and hell. Yeah. 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 And, uh, and, and Jacobock doesn't understand why the printing press is a big deal. And, you know, we find out later through all of the bartering and stuff that the angels and demons are fighting over it. Um, you know, fighting over what, you know, okay, you can have this kind of books, but we want, you know, the Bible and, and, and stuff like that. So that the, um, so there's hours of, of, uh, deliberation on that. But the thing that I didn't understand was how, why did Gutenberg have a dream about Mr. Be Gone about, you know, about Jacobock, uh, coming to him right. and, and, and giving him, uh, and giving him direction on how to build the machine. Right. So that's what I was trying to get at, that he, uh, he his role in this story is, is strange because he's just a witness. But then Gutenberg sees him in his dreams yeah. um, and he says, oh, you told me about this and you told me that uh, I should get the paper wet so the paint would look better and all that stuff. And 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 Jacobo kind of plays along with it. Right. Because uh, when he gets to mines, he ends up finding the house of uh, Johannes Gutenberg, knocks on the door ends up, you know, they open the door and they say, oh, we don't give money to beggars. And he's like, well, I'm not a beggar. Yeah. And they're like, oh, my God, he's OK. Well, uh, come in. And uh, the archbishop is there. Uh, there's the whole crew that works with Gutenberg making the printing press. And everybody knows that he looks different, that he's probably not human. And they're kind of trying to understand. And then Gutenberg says, I saw you in my dreams and you told me this, this and that. But uh I think it was Katoon entering Gutenberg's dreams, and I'll explain why. Because there's a, a, part, a part of the story where Jacobock uh, says that he had dreamt about Katoon long after they were separate, separated, and that he um, dreamt him dressed in like these fine golden robes and stuff, and um, and he was dressed that way because they were getting married. Okay. Um, and then when he goes to mines and he's at this pie maker's house and Katoon shows up and is dressed just like he was in his dream. Yeah. And at one point, Jacobock wonders, had Katoon been looking into my book of dreams? Had he gone into my dreams at night and put these dreams there? You know, so that's why I think that he might have been Katoon might have been the one to influence Gutenberg. Yeah. Um, in his construction of the printing press using Jacobock's image. Well, and it's it certainly doesn't seem like Jacobock did that himself. Yeah, you know, I think right. he just hears about it and sort of plays along, and uh, and there's an interesting twist also that this uh, archbishop turns out to be a demon. Mm -hmm. Right, and I think that Jacobock 
that's his purpose. He has to be there at that time because I believe that he he becomes words at the end. So there's this theme in regards to Jacobock being, you know, the secret of writing as, uh, you know, that, that words can change your life. Uh, the words that he wrote as a child changed his life because he ended up being burned and, and thrown out of hell. But maybe that was all a part of this sort of prophecy that led to him being there, being the witness to this deal over the printing press. And, um, he ends up becoming this kind of uh, writ of sealing between both powers, as if he's a sacrifice to seal the deal, right? After the discussion that hell and heaven is having, like, we get the ju scientific journals, you get, you know, this and that, you know. Yeah. Um, we get the Bible, you get fake news. <laughs> <You know? laughs> right, right. They didn't yeah. say fake news, but yeah, they. I mean, yeah. they, 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 they said it, but they didn't use that phrase. But that, that that's funny, yeah. Yeah, like you get you get the stuff that makes human humanity more stupid or evil, or you get yeah. like this and that, and we get this part that elevates mankind, and so we get that stuff. It's it's on us, so and we'll it, inspire that. It was funny. One of them was like, "Well, what if this is something you know, something a really good work, but it's written by a whore? Do we get that?" Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it seems like after that decision is done, and they realize that Jacobock is still there, and um. It seems like he's turned into this this uh like I said the, he's like this the payment in blood right to seal the deal yeah. and they turn him into a book and yeah, uh, that's and, the book that you have in your hands at the end and I love the line love and loss and hatred melted into words yeah 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 so he pleads to burn the book but that's just self-serving he doesn't want to die he doesn't want to be turned into ash he wants to be released by fire and when he does they'll be held to pay so, yeah, that's uh, yeah. So there were a few things I noticed here, like uh, there was a reference to the history of the devil play when oh. um, when uh, when they're Kitun and uh, Jacobock, I think, are talking. And he says, even if the machine changed the world and uh, Jacobock laughs at Kitun and says, nothing's going to change this uh, stars, sun, roads, fields on and on world without end. And that's actually. At the end of History of the Devil, the narrator is talking about how the – after all the trial of the devil uh, mm -hmm. happened, he says, things are moving on. Tomorrow the sun's going to rise on and on, world without end. Oh. So I thought that was an interesting reference from, from this. Oh, um, that's cool. That Clive put it here. Yeah. I had not noticed that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Katoon, he is described here in the book at one point as having his pupils – like those of every member of the demonation, which I love this word, the yeah, demonation. Yeah, that's the first time Clive ever used it, even though he had hell. He's hell is, has been featured lots of times. Yeah, it's like the demonation is like the the whole hierarchy of demons. You know, the whole rabble of demons in hell is called the demonation. Yeah. And he says, Katoon's uh, pupils were slits, his cornea rays of burnt umber flecked with gold. There were hints of gold, too, with the symmetrical arrangement of turquoise and purple patterns that decorated his body, though if they had ever been flawless, many years of scarring had taken their toll. That's how Kitoon looks like. I, I would love to see a painting of that. Um, yeah. The painting that he did at that bookstore that looked like Kitoon was just black and white, so I don't think that's supposed to be Kitoon. But, um, but yeah, yeah. So Jacobock, at the end... Um, I think he actually embraces his nature as a demon because at one point he says, at that moment I realized this is who I am. This is what I wanted to do. I just wanted to, uh, you know, be evil. And uh, especially after he co he's confronted with an angel, that's when it seems to like wake him into the realization that, hey, I'm a demon. I'm supposed to be evil and and uh, lying and hurt mankind and do all that stuff. And that's what I want to do from now on. And then he just gets sewn into a book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A little frustrating for him. Yeah, I. One of my favorite parts was, um, you know, how he's 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 alternating between like uh, threatening and you, to, to to get you to burn the book. He's alternating between threatening and and promising things and and uh, and pleading and 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 playing on your sympathy and and but the 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 one thing I, I the one part I I loved was the. Um, where he's promising you the the beautiful house on the hill with a big tree next to it, 
and yeah. you'll, you'll be married and have children and and it'll be, and it's this perfect life and and then you when you keep reading is like oh uh oh what's what's happening there's a strong wind and the leaves are coming off the tree oh uh, the tree's getting pulled up by the roots uh oh oh right. no the tree's falling on the house <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> There's another section where to prevent you from reading, it starts erasing words. So it, <laughs> yeah. it just becomes uh, word blank, word blank, word yeah. blank. See what I can do? I can erase the words for you. And uh, and you're like, that's really annoying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <I> know. <laughs> but there's this metaphysical kind of thing going on, right? Where he's yeah. controlling the reader. He knows that you're reading. He's yeah. telling you not to read anymore. But at the same time, he's enticing you with the promise of a story and a secret. Yeah. So... He wants you to read it through to the end. It's yeah. just using reverse psychology. And, and that, that one where he was he was writing, he was, I'll only show you every other word. And he had this long sentence with missing words. And at the end, it said armadillo. It's like, what? <laughs> what was that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so it, it was surprising to me when this book came out. I just felt like uh, it had come out of nowhere. And I yeah. was like, oh, my God, there's another book. And then I, I got my hands on the book and I read it in like a day. And I was Me like, too. oh, man, I, I already I read, read it, it. The, the night after the first book signing so that I would have it read before the second book signing. Right. And uh, yeah, it felt like I wanted more. I wanted this book to be longer. I wanted it to have more stuff. And um, but, you know, I understand it's he can only talk about the things that he witnessed. It's a book written in the first person. Yeah. And Jack Abok is just telling you a story just for the purpose of having you read through the book and then releasing him. That's, that's what he wants to do. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, but he'll makes even you wonder. settle for you just passing the book on to someone else. Yeah. He's like, okay, well you read the book. You didn't burn it. I don't think you're going to burn it at this point. So just pass it on to the next person, please. You know, maybe they'll do it. And I thought that was, that was really funny when he yeah. says that at the end. Yeah. Um, or just give it to someone you hate, someone that you'd like to see, you know, knife to death the way that I described back and forth, the way you read the, the words on the page. Yeah. So I did go to mines, um, even before, even before I read this book, uh, around 2005, 2006, a couple of years before this book came out, I did visit Germany three or four times. Cause, uh, one of my ex girlfriends was actually, uh, working there oh, wow. and I had a, I had a chance to go and she was working at the, uh, Max Planck Institute for Polymer Science, which is in Mainz. So <laughs> I ended up traveling to Frankfurt and then going to Mainz. Um, and like I said, before this book ever came out, so I had no idea. Um, and it was fun because I was able to visualize minds, even though I'm visualizing a modern minds, not mm -hmm. the one from the 1400s, but I could, I could see, you know, I knew where the river was. I knew where the, the cathedrals were. I've seen all the old stuff that they used to have. Um, so I was more, I was already kind of familiar with the city in a way. And I did go to the Gutenberg museum, um, where I got to see lots of interesting books like a couple of Gutenberg Bibles, which were the first books that were ever printed. Um, oh, wow. Of course, in this in this book, it, it kind of hints that this was the first book that Gutenberg printed, right? It was right. The, the the Mr. Begone book, the Jacobock Botch book. And I think they, uh, they but, tested it with a poem before that, right? Yes, a Sibylline Prophecies or something. And um, yeah, so when I saw those Bibles, it was pretty amazing. They were in this big strong room and you would just go in there and there was only like two Bibles open behind glass and they had all uh, this sophisticated alarm and cameras going on. And there were just wow. like a couple of lights just on the ceiling pointing down at them and everything else was dark inside the room. So um, it seems like the Bibles were just floating there <laughs> in the middle oh, of the wow. room. Yeah, even though, of course, you could see the glass covering. But the doors to that room, they were like vault doors. They were like – they were very, very thick doors. Um, and they were open, so you could go in there. But I, I'm guessing at the end of the day, they just locked those things up tight because wow. those were some of those were some of the first printed books in our history, and uh, they were Bibles. You know, they have a bejeweled cover and all that stuff. They're enormous. They're gigantic. You can pick that up with both both hands. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, not that you'd be able to pick it up, but uh, yeah. So very impressive. I saw stuff in there. I saw a printing press uh, in the lower floor of the museum. 
So I got to see all that stuff before I read this book. So I, I could see that stuff in my mind. Um, whereas maybe some people might have read the book and not really be able to visualize what a printing press looked like in the 1400s. But, I, you know, you could see it. And um, it was very, very impressive stuff. And they also had one of those editions of the Corporis Humana Fabrica, the Vesalius uh, oh, anatomist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, they had that in there as well. You could you could take a look at the plates, uh, the book, and all that. So, fabulous stuff with all the skin people and 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 skeletons holding their muscles and their skin and putting their little elbow on a little pillar and be like, oh, you know, he's contemplating his own mortality. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that's such a such a great stuff. Um, it sounds like uh, Life had probably visited the Gutenberg Museum at some point, doesn't it? Yeah, probably. Or definitely mines for sure. Um, so I, I was very, um, very surprised by this book and I yeah. liked it and I, I, I gobbled it up really quickly and I just yeah. was left wanting for more. Yeah. Well, and we can talk about some of the feedback because it seems like for some reason this book is polarizing. But uh, Catalina, who, uh, Carita, who you know helped us with the the, the video that we did at, at when we were at Texas Frightmare Weekend, uh, right? She says, from, "Beautiful mm -hmm. love story." Also oh, from Little Spark Films, yeah. Uh, also, yeah. I love this epic fight between good and evil in the Judeo-Christian sense. Genius. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, I I agree. Uh, and then Matt Stone and Don Barker said, "I love this book. An amazing novel." And Tia Wright said, "Great book." And on the Discord chat, there were a couple of people in there that's like, oh, I'd never read that one, which I was a little surprised. But, you know, I think then I kind of am a little jealous because it would be nice to be able to go back and read all these things for the first time. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. And Stephen Baxter said, sure. Where is the art three? <laughs> like that kind of you can do that on you can comment that kind of stuff to us. That's fine. But that right. kind of thing is what made Clive stop going on Facebook. Well, uh, yeah, I, you know, Clive is working on it. That's all we know about it. That's, yeah. uh, he still wants to finish Aberat before he gets into the great and secret show. So I wouldn't expect that to come anytime soon. Yeah. And, uh, Josh, uh, Magsman said, I love everything Barker, but I'm sorry, Mr. Be Gone, while fun is weak in the scheme of things. So I wouldn't say it's weak. I just think it's different. You know, it's like um, it, it's a little bit like an elongated Books of Blood story, like the way the Damnation game is. Right, right. Um, or the I Hellbound think Heart or Cabal. It's, right. it's kind of more in the vein of those books. And it's it comes from a later stage in Clive's life where he he was not the same person he was when he wrote the Books of Blood. And in an interview he gave to Lucy Snyder, um, at the Writer's Workshop of Horror in 2009, he said, I made a huge mistake with Mr. Be Gone. I should never have made the creature a demon. I should have done something that didn't lay that expectation into the text. I was horribly disappointed by reader reactions. It was oh. a book that, meant, that means a lot to me. It was a comedic book, a dark one, certainly, but essentially a comedy, a comedy of how we come to be human or fail to. And I certainly enjoyed writing it. It was just a lovely experience. And to find so many readers saying, why can't he just give us the books of blood again? Ugh. That was the, the the cry of the heart, you know. It really was the essence of the complaint of people who didn't like it. Their objection was that I was writing horror again, but I wasn't writing it the way I used to. Well, of course I wasn't writing it the way I used to. The books of blood were 25 years ago. I'm a different human being now, you know. I don't want to write the way I used to write. I have no interest in doing that. That would be tiresome and boring. And I think it would be boring for them too. So you can't please all the people all the time. Yeah. All you can do is, is what pleases you and hope that it pleases other people. I love my readers and I respect my readers, but I'm not going to simplify or echo myself, copy myself, just so the sales will be better. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a real shame, you know, and, and, um, Sometimes, sometimes fans are the, are the worst, you know, cause it's like, we're all just different people and we all have different opinions about things. And, and, uh, and I think that you could have a hundred positive reviews and the, the one negative one is the one that's going to stick out and, you know, and hurt the most and, and have the most impact. 
Um, well, yeah, people people who have followed uh, an author's work for years and years, I guess they at some point they do feel like they're, I wouldn't say owed, but mm -hmm. I feel they have this expectation that they create in their mind and they project all of their ideas of success and uh, and the formula that they're used to, if there's a formula, and they expect that to be used over and over because it works yeah. for them. Yeah, but yeah, and it probably it, doesn't work for the author. So if it doesn't work for the author anymore, if he doesn't want to repeat that thing, then um, you need to be more open-minded and, and understand that um, this is what you're getting. So if this doesn't work for you, that's fine. Uh, it's your right to say, "Hey, this book didn't work for me." Okay, but you know, the author is going to do whatever he wants. That's that's what defines an artist. Yeah. Is it's his vision of the world. It's his work. And all we can do is just be part of the audience and say, hey, I like this or I didn't like it. Well, and that's like it. This attitude that, OK, you've done enough new things. Now start making sequels to the stuff that I already like. Right. You know, so like I, that that comment, you know, sure. Where is the art three? It's like, yeah, of course, he's you know, he's talked about it and he's been working on it. But but he's he's going to follow his own his own um, muse and and. Right. But, you know, I mean, it's his right to ask about the book three. I mean, I'm not saying that he's he's doing anything wrong by asking that. I'm just saying that if you think if you think that you can um, corner an author into doing what you want uh, yeah. because yeah, you're right. you're a member of the audience, then that's not going to happen because yeah. you have to understand the author is going to do whatever they want to do. And um, right. And, you know, when right. someone does what their fans expect, then we're talking about commercialism a little bit more, you know, yeah. the, the author is going to make a, a piece of work that is designed to sell because he knows it's going to be successful because he knows it's going to reproduce a formula that works. Then at that point, it becomes more like a, a production, like a, a product instead of a piece of art. Um, so I think that's what defines uh, art and a product. Um, and I'm not saying that a product can't be artistic uh but there's a lot of design that goes into a product but i'm thinking that if you want if you want a piece of art then you have to give that freedom to the artist to create what he wants to create and i love the scarlet gospels but i kind of get the sense that that book came out because of pressure from the fans and possibly before it was ready um, sure. I'm, um, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't know, um, for sure. It yeah. seems like they, they were just trying to, they wanted to get it out. Right. Because yeah. lots of people have been waiting for it. And I think it's something, I think there was also something uh, in there that Clive wanted to have that thing completed and put out because yeah. he kept saying that he wanted to get rid of Pinhead in his own terms. And also maybe a little bit of what went into making the Scarlet Gospels was because Clive was disappointed by the franchise uh, of the Hellraiser franchise sequels. Yeah. That also kind of pushed him into asserting himself as, hey, Pinhead is my character and um, I, I'm done with him. <laughs> yeah. You know, so this is this is going to be my little revenge of sorts. I wouldn't call it revenge, but this is yeah. going to be my 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 point of contention. It's like, OK, I'm I'm, I'm putting an end to Pinhead. Yeah. I'm done with this character. I'm taking the reins and I'm killing off the, the pinhead that you've created, you know, that you made for the, all these sequels, you know. Right, right. Right. And then and so Josh goes on to say, dude, I'm sorry. Celebrating Mr. Be Gone is like celebrating Tommyknockers. It may be the weakest work in Clive's repertoire. Um, hey, I like the Tommy Knockers. I like the movie. <laughs> I don't I don't know Tommy Knockers at all. So that's just kind of yeah. that one goes right over my head. But I would say I don't I, I think that anybody who says that Mr. Be Gone is the weakest of Clive's work should go watch Transmutations. Uh, yeah, <laughs> of course, Clive would argue that's not his work. But, yeah, yeah uh, right. But, yeah. It's, you know. Well, or, or Saint Sinner. Right. Yeah. Or the sci fi adaptation of uh, Saint Sinner, because yeah. it has almost nothing to do with the, uh, yeah. the actual No, it's just, just the title, but. But but yeah, he was a producer for it. I choose not to think of things as like this is the most successful and this is the the most weak of yeah. of this artist's output. Yeah. I I tend to think of it as like this one works better for me and this one doesn't work as well for me. Yeah. But you know, 
I still give it the worth that it comes from an artist that I admire. And of course, I'm not saying he's like dismissing it, but um, yeah, it's like when someone asks you, what's your what's your favorite author? What's your favorite book or what's your top yeah. five books? It's hard to say that because as hard. you as you know more and more stuff and as you learn more about art and uh, and, and what it's worth for you and, and what's the subjectivity of art, how it works for some people while it works it doesn't work at all for others. You start to understand that, you know, I like certain things in a certain book and then I don't like certain things there that, you know, work, li you know, don't work as well for me. Like, but I still like it as a piece of art. Well, so, and, and comparing it to other Clive Barker work, too, it's apples and oranges, right? I mean, you you can't compare this to like Imagica. It's not the same kind of a book at all. Right. It's not. Yeah. So Clive was thinking of this as a, a more grounded uh ninth circle of hell demon kind of almost comedy kind of thing like where the demon's always telling you to burn the book whereas he says it himself here um in in an interview and i, I could quote that for you mm -hmm. um you said that this is a different book from a magic i agree completely and clive himself said to fangoria on number 268 november 2007 it's a completely different kind of writing from third person because when you're constructing a narrative that way, it's a different kind of language you're using. Botch's language is particular to himself. He's not one for highfalutin terms. He speaks in basic short sentences. The kind of language I used in Imagica, for instance, which was long sentences with many clauses in them and lengthy, dense paragraphs, was totally unwanted here. What I needed was Botch's simple demonic voice. And once I had that... It flowed pretty well. I had a little research to do on the Gutenberg stuff. Then I went to it. So that's how he did it. Um, and yeah. that's why it's it, – it, I understand. I mean I wasn't – parts of this book that didn't work as well for me were like the parts where he keeps telling you to burn the book. And even though there are funny moments like the house that you mentioned and he says, oh, you're still reading it. Oh, the leaves are falling. Oh, yeah. the tree fell on the house. Yeah. Or the part where he starts erasing letters from the page and says – Aha, uh -huh, see, I can prevent you from reading it. But he doesn't really follow through with it, right? Because he wants you to continue reading it. So it, that stuff works for me, but I think it's a little hard when you're reading it because it's like you want to get back to the story, but he's interrupting his own story with, you know, with that, you know, right. with that stuff. And you're like, all right, you know, I'm not going to burn the book. Just, you know, carry on. Let's go. <laughs> He's holding that story as kind of a little carrot. And I think yeah. some people might have been a little disappointed at the end because they don't really get the end. And I think the end is a little open to interpretation because at some point Jacobock is in Gutenberg's house and he gets um, – we discovered that Gutenberg was married to a lady called Hannah. Yeah. And she turns out to be an angel and yeah. the archbishop turns out to be a demon. And they kind of shed their – disguises and it's like oh okay now i now i see where this is going it's going to be they're going to sit at a table in in, in this room that's kind of like the tardis where there's this uh door at gutenberg's workshop and jacobock botch gets um hit with a flaming sword by an angel and he bleeds and he falls on the floor and he passes out and then when he wakes up he sees that people um are behind that door and he walks in and he discovers, Oh, this is a gigantic room and there's a table there and there's all these angels and demons at the table and there's Gutenberg and there's Katoon mm -hmm. and there's the archbishop and Hannah, the angel. And, um, he missed what they were talking about and he doesn't really understand what they're discussing. And there's this big argument and, and there's, uh, Hannah, the angel and the archbishop are just yelling at each other over each other. And they're discussing what they're going to claim for each kingdom in terms of the printed matter or the, or the power of the printed matter. And, um, and so where, where was I going with this? I was going with this towards the point of, um, how, the, yeah, how so, he wrote it to be different, you know, in a different right, style and, than, and so the story ends where Jacobock gets turned into a book and that's all that he can witness. And then we don't know what else happened, yeah. but it leaves us with that idea that the whole crux of the matter here was, Who's going to take control of the printed press? And, you know, for a while, uh, of course, the church wanted lots of stuff to be printed, right? And then eventually more civil, more, you know, daily stuff started being printed, like uh, secular, philosophy, yeah. secular stuff, you know? And then politics and then political pamphlets and then 
you know, um, school books and all that stuff. So it, it, it kind of, that's, that's the thing. That's the whole secret is that the printing press changed the world. And it did because now we're holding a book and a book that was printed. Right. Yeah. And we have books that every, everybody has books at home. You know, maybe some people don't, but I don't want to know those people, <laughs> but, <laughs> but everybody has books in their house. Everybody was raised with books. We read books for entertainment. We read them for education. Um, we, we write stuff down, we write stuff by hand, we type stuff up and we print it up. And, 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 and that's how mankind has picked up the pace of our culture and our education and our knowledge. We just started storing it and printing it into books. And that, that way the next generation has an entire trove of stuff that they can read. And, um, yeah, so that's, that's the power of it. That's the big secret is that print printing press changed the world and it did. Paul Fluitt went on to say, or he said, I don't usually get truly terrified by books. I can usually distance myself from the story when I put the book down, but this one haunted me. I read three quarters of it in one reading at one at night while in bed, and I guess that's what that was what the first mistake. It pol polarizes opinion, but I think it's a great throwaway tale. So... I, do, I guess I can see he, he probably by throwaway, he probably means like because it's short, you know, mm -hmm. so you're done with it really quick. Because, um, I mean, I guess throwaway can sound like a, you know, a negative thing. And I, I that kind of annoyed me at first because I don't I don't see it as like disposable. But right. I, I guess if you mean that it's short and you're done with it really fast, I could see that. Yeah, that's the only context I would see that working because. Arguably, every book is a throwaway book. Once you read it, you move on with the rest of your day, and yeah. you don't just sit there for weeks thinking about the book. So, in a sense, every book is a throwaway book. It's it's how you say it, right? It's like, yeah. like you said, I think it's meant as a, a short book that you read it and then you kind of forget about it. But you yeah. know, it's it's not quite a novella because I think technically a novella is supposed to be below one hundred pages. Um, right. But it, but it's 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 short and it's kind of close to that. It's two hundred and thirty or something like that. I think. Mm -hmm. I, I can attest that it was definitely not a throwaway book for me because here we are years after, yeah. <laughs> eleven years after the fact. Um, here we are talking about the book, making a whole episode, and and you're sitting there with the earphones in your ears listening to us talk about it. So <laughs> yeah. you obviously are either interested in the book or you've read the book and now you want to know a little more about what went behind it. So yeah, I hope we brought a little bit to the table about that. Yeah. Yeah. And K Katie Leach said, I thought it was an interesting concept to a story. I wondered for a while why he kept saying burn this book at first thinking it was to protect the reader from a scary story. Uh, Clever demon also loved the bit with the babies. Actually the bit with the babies uh, is kind of threw me because I'm like, oh, dude, am I not sympathetic to this character anymore? I'm starting to I'm starting to lose it, you know? Yeah. You mean when uh, Jacobock is bathing in the blood of infants? Yes, and he he, bra he dragged bags of babies to back to their house, and there was a hole in one of the bags, and all these screaming babies were left, you know, he left a trail of screaming babies all the way up to the house. Hey, that's the comedy part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> You're imagining Jackabock box with a big bag of kids. Uh, oh, there's a hole in it. So he left a trail of wailing children. <laughs> yeah. <It's, laughs> uh, yeah, that's a, that's the a comedy right there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But the idea that there's all these dead babies all around him and he's bathing in their blood and Quatoon is like kicking them aside to get up close to him. When it's so over the top, it's just that it, it's just not horrifying anymore. It's just uh, they're just there. Yeah, they're it's just horrifying there. if you're a parent. Yeah, it is, I guess. Yeah. yeah. I can see that. Yeah. Um, but I still love this book. Uh I, I probably I probably like you know, I like Cabal, but I probably like reading this one a little more, just because it I think it's maybe a little more fun than reading Cabal. Mm hmm Sure. I, I agree. Um and if we're comparing it to the other books that are roughly the same length. So one thing that this book also had were foreign editions, and some of them were really, really cool. Um, I was looking here at the um, at the uh, Clyde Barker Revelations Facebook page, mm -hmm. and sometimes they post covers from international editions of Clyde Barker's books. And um, there have been some very, very cool editions of uh, Mr. Be Gone. In some countries, it's called 
um, the demon in the book. Uh, others call it like the the Gutenberg demon and this and that. Oh, so yeah, yeah you know, right. Because always... that that title is is sort of a pun that wouldn't work when you translate it. Right. Um, and you know you got uh, some of them have brand new cover art that was for the book. Some have inside art that was made for the book. Um, you have Spanish editions, French editions, Slovakian editions. Uh, the actually the the French French one uh, it's called Le Demon de Gutenberg, which means the Gutenberg demon. There's actually a cool looking demon on the cover with the two tails. So oh, it seems cool. like it was made. Yeah, it was made specifically for this, I guess. And the Italian edition has uh, what looks like the Vitruvian Man by Leonardo da Vinci. You know, the guy with the two sets of arms and the yes. two sets of legs. Mm -hmm. And then there's the two sets of tails. So, Oh, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, that's that's very, very neat. Um, so, And in the Spain, they called it Demonio de Libro, which means the demon, demon in, the in the book. Yeah. Um, but I think there was an Italian edition that even has, like, painted art inside. And I saw a picture of this. There has, like, Papagatmus caught in his... Uh, uh, Net. trap yeah yeah being pulled up and you see the two tails and stuff so yeah i, I would love to uh, know more about that edition i will um it's from anteprima um i think it would Ante be Prima. cool just to flip through that and see all the pictures yeah it's it's Even published if you by don't speak italian yeah it's it's published by independent legions uh they publish horror dark and thriller books and they have this um uh, uh, the Clyde Barker, Jackabock, Il Demone del Libro. <laughs> so that's really, really awesome. That's the one that has a Vitruvian, um, a Vitruvian demon on the cover. And then there's like some, some art in, on the inside. And um, like I said, the Papagatmus painting of him being hauled in his net up through the circles of hell. So very, very neat stuff. And uh, it never, it, we never got a deluxe edition in America. So uh, maybe in a few years, we might be able to see something like that. Yeah, yeah, maybe like Earthling or somebody will do one. Yeah, it'd be sweet. Yeah. Um, well, is there anything else that you wanted to, to talk about? Well, the one? audio book of this was oh, uh, recorded gosh. by yeah. Doug Bradley, right? Yeah, and I I, um, I actually did both because I listened to the audio book and followed along in the printed book this time when I read it as much as I could. I mean, not while I was driving. You know, but oh wow! <laughs> so you're not just reading the book; you get the voice of Jackabock talking to you. That's yeah. that's really a interesting experience. It was fun. You know, I think that um, I can't praise that audio book enough because I think Doug Bradley is an amazing, uh, an amazing narrator for this, and he's got different I've heard... voices for all the different characters. And yeah, I've heard he plays a really good demon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right. Legend has it. Yeah, I, I didn't listen to the book for this one, but uh, I, I did remember reading it, um, uh, listening to the audio book when it came out. So that was a, a good experience there. Yeah, I think I had and, only listened to part of it when it came out. But this time I did the whole thing and and read along in the book for probably like three quarters of the of the of it. And I just want to remind our readers that uh, our listeners that if you like Clyde Barker's audiobooks, you can also listen to Tonight Again, uh, which is narrated by Doug Bradley. I believe it's available on, was it Audible? Yeah, yeah. And, and he also did the um, the Venus Complex, uh, the first of Barbie Wilde's uh, novels. He also um, recorded an audiobook of that, so I also recommend that one. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I I, I want to hear that actually. We haven't. We haven't really gotten a chance to get to that yet, but I think that would be fun to visit probably next year sometime. Yeah, that'd be a, that'd be a good episode idea. Uh, make yeah. a review of the Venus Complex audiobook and talk a little bit about the book. Yeah, yeah, that'd be a very interesting episode. That's a that's a horrible kind of creepy character, and it'll be really neat to see uh, or to hear, you know, Doug Bradley's interpretation. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, in this podcast, having no beginning will have no end. Burn this podcast. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. You can find the show notes for this episode and join the discussion over at www.clivebarkercast.com, where we have news, features, reviews, and links to all the ways you can connect with us. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts and every other place you can find podcasts. 
Clive Barker Podcast, or BarkerCast, is an independent editorial podcast and news blog that is not affiliated with or under contract by Clive Barker or Seraphim Inc. This is a labor of love by the fans for the fans. Thanks for listening.